Today's gospel reading will come from Luke 23. Two others also who were criminals were led away to be put to death with him. When they came to the place that is called the skull, they crucified Jesus there with the criminals, one on his right hand and one on his left. One of the criminals who were hanged there kept derating him saying, are you not the Messiah? Save yourself and us. But the other rebuked him saying, do you not fear God since you were under the same sentence of condemnation? And we indeed have been condemned justly for we are getting what we deserve for our deeds. But this man has done nothing wrong. Then he said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. He replied, truly, I tell you, today you'll be with me in paradise. This is the word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks be to God. Today is the first Sunday of Lent. It's this Christian season that is the 40 days, not counting Sundays, before Easter. During Lent, it's a time when we journey with Jesus towards the cross, through the joys of Palm Sunday, through the sorrow at the cross, and ultimately ending at Easter. But we don't rush there yet. This Lent, Pastor Christy Jordan and I are going to be leading us through a sermon series based on the book, Witness at the Cross by Amy Jill Levine. This is an interesting book. Amy uh, is a Jewish New Testament scholar. She's brilliant. Each of the chapters in this book is, off, is based off of a different character who was a witness to the Good Friday events. Today we'll be talking about the other victims who died alongside of Jesus. Next week, Pastor Christie will talk about the soldiers. Later, we'll hear about the beloved disciple, the women, Mary and Mary Magdalene, Joseph of, Amer of, um, geez, <laughs> of Arimathea, thank you, friends, and Nicodemus. That's the week I'm preaching, so I'll have to get that straight by then. But I hope you guys enjoy this journey through Holy Week. I hope that this helps add a rich layer of depth to this story that we've heard so many times before, the story of Jesus' life, death, and eventually resurrection. I hope by hearing it through these different perspectives, you start to pick up on things and details that you didn't know before. So today we will be focusing on the other victims, those who died with Christ. You see, they witnessed Jesus on the cross in such an intimate way. Their suffering binds each other together. They had a unique understanding of Jesus in that moment because they too knew what it felt like to hang there in utter agony. They too knew what it would feel like to cry out. They too knew what it felt like to be persecuted to the fullest extent of the law. I'll be honest, I didn't spend a lot of time studying these victims until this week. These criminals, as they're often referred to, most of the time in the church, they only get mentioned on Good Friday, when, let's be honest, no one shows up on Good Friday to grieve these criminals. We're there to mourn Jesus. So their story gets brushed over. We often assume we know everything we need to know about them based on one word. Criminal. So this week I've tried to dig deeper into their story. I've been asking questions like, who are they? What did they care about? What did they do to deserve being put to death in such a cruel way? What I found out, unfortunately, was that there's not a lot of clear answers in our scriptures or in our tradition. This is the only account we have of them. The Gospel of Mark calls these men robbers, and other translations call them thieves or bandits. One article I read kind of took a middle way, a different approach, deeming one criminal as good and the other as bad. They tried to distinguish their character from this account of the last moments of their lives. 
because one criminal joined in belittling Jesus, he was bad, and the other was God-fearing and thus must have been pretty good. Another article that I found uh, pointed out that the crucifixion was reserved for the most extreme crimes, often political ones, which that makes sense to me, right? Since Jesus' crime was threatening the status quo of the Roman Empire by proclaiming the good news, right? About God's kingdom coming. This article suggested that perhaps these criminals were more like freedom fighters trying to stand up to the injustices they saw. Some might would even call them patriots. Others, traitors. Now, wouldn't that change the narrative? Wouldn't that change the way we view these men? Suddenly, they go from criminals to victims. When I found this article, I was so taken aback because I'd never heard it like this before. I took the article and I ran into Diana's office, our secretary, and I said, this is a juicy scoop. <laughs> it was. It was groundbreaking to me to think about them in such a different light. But the truth is, we don't know for certain what the crimes of these other two victims were. We don't know if their motives were valiant and just or greedy and corrupt. But does it really matter? I mean, if we knew for certain, sure, it might would change the way we interpret this story, the way we view these supporting characters. But does it matter that we know? Because what we do know is Jesus. Jesus who ate with sinners. Jesus who said, let the one without sin cast the first stone. It was Jesus who proclaimed release to the captive. You see, we know Jesus. The Jesus who is characterized by his mercy, his grace, his compassion, and his forgiveness. We know the Jesus who came to die for both the criminal and the innocent the sinner and the saint and everyone in between. We know the Jesus who said, I was in prison and you came to visit me. A couple weeks ago, Jackie and I were leading confirmation class with some of our middle schoolers and we were learning about our Methodist heritage and our Methodist roots by talking about some of the spiritual practices and habits of John Wesley, the founder of Methodism. The youth were particularly interested in two of John Wesley's um, famous spiritual disciplines, fasting and visiting people in prison. Both of these seem pretty timely for Lent. The youth asked questions like, why did he visit people in prison? You mean he went and saw people he didn't even know? Why would he do that? So I gave the pastor answer, the answer that's always right in Sunday school, because Jesus told us to. <laughs> Referring to the verse that I just mentioned, I was in prison and you came to visit me. Sure, I was giving the right answer, but that answer I realized was so detached, almost emotionless. I must confess that I have never visited a prison. Yet, here I was giving an answer that somehow let me feel like I was sliding by, not feeling any remorse for not abiding by Jesus' command. But luckily for us, Charles Sharp is one of the confirmation mentors. Charles is active in the Kairos prison ministry in our community, and he shared the real reason why it's so important that we do this as Christians he spoke to the youth with conviction and from the heart, sharing some of his own experiences. He said, it's important because often when people go to jail, they feel forgotten. Sure, they might get a lot of visits from friends and family at the beginning, but eventually those trickle out. They can start to feel lonely, and then they start to feel like they don't matter. Whew. That's why Jesus told us we ought to visit those in prison. For me to say so coldly, Jesus told us so without even bothering to channel the compassion that Jesus was trying to instill in me. Lord, have mercy. 
that feeling, that desire to be remembered, it's age old, it's almost universal. That very same feeling that was shared between these victims suffering with Jesus, the one dying plea, his one final request, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. Jesus, remember me. Isn't that what we all want? Deep down on some human level, we all want to be remembered. To be remembered is to matter. That feeling we get when somebody remembers your name or your favorite candy or your birthday. By the way, today's Jordan's birthday. I hate putting them on the spot like that, but it just makes such a good example because every time I say that, everyone oohs or ahs or chuckles, and then he smiles because it feels good, right? It gives us that warm, fuzzy feeling to be remembered and to be thought of as someone special. But to be forgotten, to feel forgotten, nobody wants to feel like that. I think back to the one time my dad forgot to pick me up from school. You know, you might know the feeling when you're the last kid left in the cafeteria waiting for the teacher to call your name, and then the teacher gets tired of waiting, so she sends you off to wait in the principal's office. Ah, that's what it felt like to feel forgotten for half an hour, an hour or so at most. But what must it feel like to suffer in plain view but people choose not to remember that in the voting booth or when they pray or in their actions. What must it feel like to be forgotten to the point that we say Jesus said so? And even that does not make us weep with compassion. This plea to be remembered, it isn't just about the future. This plea isn't just a call to remember it's to make sure that we never treat our fellow human beings like numbers on a uniform or on a roll call. It's that we treat each other as individuals, as children of God. Prisoner, parolee, or not, child of God. A call to remember is a call for compassion, a call for second chances, a call to be more like Jesus. Because memory is so powerful. Memory is actually powerful enough to provoke a moral change within us. That's one of the hardest things to change. You see, in the Bible, the Israelites were asked by God to remember when you were a slave in Egypt and to remember the covenant I made with my people. Then he would go on to give new commandments. You see, to create a new kingdom, to bring God's kingdom to earth, we have to remember where we come from. We have to remember whose we are. And we have to let that history and that memory affect us. Even on a global scale, society and our country must learn from our history. We must hear the stories of those who feel forgotten. We must remember if we ever want to make any change. Memories are especially powerful in cases of death. All three of these men are dying, Jesus and the other victims, whether sinner or saint or a combination of the two. We also wonder, how will I be remembered? Or even, who will remember me? Jesus and the other victims are no exception to this. Memories are so important in the mourning process. Even Jesus, this, didn't, don't, this is the first time I'm saying this in this message because it dawned on me in the last service. Even Jesus wanted to be remembered. We're going to have his holy supper. Do this in remembrance of me. Even days before his own death, he was concerned. He asked his disciples, his followers, to remember him. You see, these memories, these traditions, these things that call us back are so important. I think of the many of us at Millbrook who have felt comfort from telling stories of a loved one who's passed on. Even yesterday, we had this time of sharing, sharing of stories that make us laugh, that make us cry, stories that take us back to a time when things just felt right in the world. Stories help keep our memory alive. 
So what's striking to me is that this dying man's final plea is that another dying man, Jesus, would remember him. That's kind of peculiar. Why would he ask Jesus to remember him when he's dying himself? Why wouldn't he call out to the soldiers or to someone looking on to remember him, someone who's guaranteed another day? Perhaps it's because this man knows something about Jesus. Perhaps it's that this man knows that somehow the cross is not truly the end for Jesus, and because it's not the end for Jesus, it's not the end for him, and it's not the end for any of us. We tend to think of remembering those who have died in such a way that we are the ones doing the remembering. But here in Luke, this this paradigm shift, it allows us a different point of view. What would it mean for those who have died to remember us? That gives me hope. That fills me with comfort. What would it mean to know that God remembers us, that we are not forgotten, that we matter to God? You see, I learned this week in the Old Testament, the term for memory is used 213 times. And most of the time, the majority of the time that word is used, it's referring to God remembering us. God remembering the promises he has made. God remembering his children. What a thought. That Jesus, sitting at the right hand of God the Father, is remembering us right now in paradise, speaking our name to the Father. Jesus, remember me, is probably one of the most relatable lines in the Bible because it gets to the heart of our shared humanity. It reaches one of our most fundamental worries that we might be forgotten that we will realize all along that we're actually just dust. But it also reaches one of our most profound hopes, that one day we will be remembered and welcomed into paradise with the one who gave it all up to save us. So friends, here we are in the in-between. Once dust, but not yet in paradise. If we take seriously the Lord's prayer, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven, then we all have some remembering to do this Lent. Remember each other. Remember your neighbor, but also remember the wrongfully accused. Remember the rightfully accused. Remember the survivors who feel unheard or scared to tell their story. Remember the grief-stricken. Remember those who are terminally ill. Remember people all across the world who are fearing for their lives as we speak. Remember those in our own city who are hungry, unhomed, or hated. Remember them in your heart. Remember them in your prayers, in your politics, in your giving. Remember them in all your living and in all your loving. Amen.